So let me just get all my things set up. So we're gonna get started. Um, so hello, my name is Brittany. I am a registered dietitian at On Point Nutrition. If you're not sure who we are, um, we are a Philly-based virtual nutrition counseling practice. Um, we see clients from all over the world. We treat a number of different nutrition illnesses and we help people lose weight and we help people with their relationship with food and we do a number of things. So if you're interested about becoming an on-point client, you can definitely reach out to me and I will point you in the right direction or you can just head over to our website. And so I know you all know what you've signed up for tonight, which is the webinar called Eat the Binge. And as I said, I'm just going to say it one more time since everyone's rolling in. It's recorded. It's a recorded web webinar tonight. So if you don't want your video to be shown, you can turn your video off and you won't be on our YouTube channel unless you want to be. And then that's totally cool. So again, feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions throughout um, the webinar tonight. I will be answering most of them at the end of my little slide, my little slideshow here. And so um, if you have a burning question, you can let me know, but I'm going to try to keep questions to the end. If you have a question that you'd like to ask me privately, you can definitely message me privately and I'll do my best to answer. So here we are, Beat the Binge webinar. Um, the first question on everyone's mind is probably, what is binge eating, right? So technically, binge eating is when a person is consuming a large amount of food at once, typically very fast, and typically when they're not very hungry. Um, it becomes a disorder when you binge eat multiple times, right, within your week or within your day. Um, but we can't really talk about binge eating without talking about overeating, which a lot of people find might be their issue more than a classic binge eating diagnosis. Um, and so both of these things involve a mindless behavior. And so I'm sorry, everybody, I'm just trying to let people in as I'm talking. Uh, let's do that. Okay, everybody's in. Um, and so the, the difference between binge eating and overeating, definitely an important thing to pay attention to. Um, some examples of overeating would be having more than one dessert after dinner, um, finishing a whole bag of popcorn while you're watching a movie, eating a pint of ice cream after a breakup. Like these are things that would be considered overeating. Things that would be considered technically binge eating are um, sneaking and finishing food in secret and then feeling guilty later, continuing to eat very quickly, um, even when you're already uncomfortably full. So these are things that would be considered binge eating. But what I want to note before we dive into this more is that I don't want us to get caught up in the details, right? So if you're feeling guilty, if you're feeling uncomfortable, if you're unhappy about a habit, the techniques and coping skills are basically the same. Binge eating is, yes, a diagnosable eating disorder. And, um, you know, if that is a category that you fall in, you would want to see a therapist, you'd want to see a dietitian. The type of path you take might be a little bit differently. But the skills I'm talking about tonight are more of a broad overview of what you can do if you experience binge eating or overeating. And I'll be using these terms interchangeably. And so don't feel like if you don't fall into one of these two categories that you can't benefit from some of the things I'll be talking about tonight. Um, and so let's see, I'm still trying to work my technology here tonight. So the next question on everyone's mind probably is, why do we binge? And that really is the million dollar question, right? You've probably overeaten or binged before, and afterwards you're always asking yourself, why did I do that? What happened? So good news and bad news, it is complicated. But we know a few things. We know that people who are predisposed to having an addictive personality, depression, anxiety, all of these things can lead to people reaching for food for comfort. Great, right? That doesn't really solve anything, but it's good to know. 
Um, second, a lot of times it becomes an ingrained habit that we reach for food for comfort or to quell some sort of emotion or simply just out of conditioning. So once you binge eat, um, many times your body and your brain become conditioned to expect that demand of the binge, right? So your brain automatically sends you cues that binge eating is necessary for survival and you have to do it now. Um, so that would be more of a conditioning way that binge eating might happen in a person's life. Um, fortunately, it is actually a reaction of a healthy brain wanting to do things that make you feel good, wanting to boost that serotonin in your, in your mind and body, your brain doesn't always like know what in the moment is good or bad for you. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more when we talk about your caveman brain or your lizard brain. Um, but comforting emotions is definitely something that can cause binge eating or overeating a lot of the time. Um, and so, whether you're feeling stressed, anxious, bored, angry, lonely, you might not always be able to pinpoint it, but a lot of times reaching for food, binge eating, overeating to quell those emotions are what a lot of us may feel. And then I did wanna to touch on what's called the caveman brain or the lizard brain. Now this is really the survival instinct part of your brain. It's your fight or flight response. And so getting back to some of those ingrained or conditioned habits, binge eating is many times an adaptive response to calorie restriction. If you haven't eaten all day and you feel like you're being like so good and then all of a sudden you're having 12 bags of chips and a pint of ice cream. That is another symptom of a healthy brain because your brain is trying to protect you if you're not getting the proper nutrients, you're not nourishing yourself and so on. And so keeping that caveman brain in mind can sometimes give you a little bit of relief when you look at your day as a whole and you haven't eaten all day and then suddenly you've eaten a ton of food and you're not really sure why. That can be one explanation. The other thing that I do see in a lot of clients who um, experience binge eating are, is this idea of all or nothing thinking. We feel like if we're being healthy one day, we're being good one day, then it's all of that. And if we've had one cookie, then we're not healthy for the day. We pop all four tires on our car and we're just down for the count for that day. And this is sometimes called black and white thinking. A lot of times this really does lead to some of those binge eating activities because we're just like, all right, I'm just gonna do this now and I'll deal with the rest tomorrow. So some explanations for binge eating, not all, but some. And next slide. So the important thing to remember here is that everyone is different. Yes, we know everyone is different, right? But please remember there's really no one size fits all approach for overcoming binge eating. Some days you might need one technique, some days you might need another. And so some things that I like to ask people are, which discomfort would you rather? The temporary discomfort you have while not acting on an urge to binge or overeat or the post binge discomfort. So some of these questions can help your caveman brain or those like conditioned habits to be redirected to a more positive path. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but for some people, emotions typically trigger a binge uh, or a binge eating habit. And eventually the binge eating habit may stay even if the emotions no longer exist. So if you've used binge eating to help you get through a difficult time and you're no longer in that difficult time, because of the way our brain works, that conditioned pattern of getting immediate gratification might still stick around. And so again, all of this is just things to note um, about the way our brain chemistry works, the way these things tend to play out. Um, and there's really nothing you need to do with this information except for say, huh, that's interesting. Um, an, intense, an intense urge to binge does not respond to logical thinking. So a lot of times if you've been in a technical binge episode, your logical brain just doesn't respond, right? Like if you had asked yourself the day before or the day after a binge, 
if that was like a reasonable thing to do, you would say, of course not. But there's something else that overcomes people, especially when um, they are diagnosed with binge eating that um, doesn't respond to those logical thoughts. And again, it is a symptom of a healthy brain. It is just a brain that is conditioned in a different way that doesn't benefit your health. Um, but for most people, reactions happen without your conscious input um, or your brain creates this reaction. So most of the time, if you would have asked your like reasonable self, uh, should I have 12 brownies if I'm sad? The connection's not really there, right? If you're sad, you need something else. But in the, in the mind of a person who experiences these types of urges to binge, the connection is created within the brain and it makes a lot of sense. Um, so, questions so far. I know I said I was going to kind of go through the questions towards the end, but does anyone have any questions right now? And I'll wait about a couple seconds. I know there's on a delay. Okay, no questions right now. Um, and for those of you who might've come in a little bit later, I'm, I am gonna leave a long, like a, a good while at the end for some questions. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. So ways to cope. I will um, say that from my experience working with clients, these have been some very helpful tips. Um, I have created a worksheet um, that I will send to everybody tomorrow after the webinar recording goes up on either your member portal if you're a client or um, on YouTube. And these questions will be a part of that worksheet and it will be, um, you can fill in the blank and kind of like write along with it. And it's a bit of a journal activity. So some helpful insights. Um, I've wrote, I've kind of come across these questions from a number of resources. And if you have a piece of paper, might as well jot some things down. Now, if you want to kind of look in, you know, on your phone, on your notes page and, and start brainstorming ideas. Um, I'd like everyone, you know, who knows someone who binge eats or binge eats themselves or overeats themselves um, to, to use this to put yourself in a curiosity mindset over a judgmental one. So these questions aren't meant to be, you know, you do this and you do that. It's meant to be, okay, why do I do this? Like what's going on? Um, and do these actions align with my health goals? Um, so if you have some paper, why not write, you know, some answers to these questions, they will be on the worksheet that I send out. Um, but these can help you to navigate your binge eating or overeating behaviors. Um, so the first question is, do my food and activity choices come from a place of self-care? A lot of times we might be working out or eating from a place of restriction or a place of, you know, dislike of ourselves. So, you know, again, I'm not going to go through every single one of these questions, but let's, let's go to the next one. Am I using food to help comfort my negative emotions or uncomfortable feelings? Um, most of us might say yes, right? It does happen. But when it kind of crosses a line is when you, when it starts to affect your everyday life, your emotions and your attitude, that is when it's time to take a closer look. So uh, I'm gonna give everybody a couple of seconds to take a look at this slide. And if anything pops out at you, you can write it in the chat. Or if you just want to kind of journal a little bit, I'm just going to give everyone a couple of seconds to take a look here. Um, I will say the last question that says, do I trust my body to tell me when to stop eating? A lot of times we lose those cues. A lot of times those cues get, you know, taken away from us if we've lived a very restrictive lifestyle. Um, so again, very helpful slide here, uh, but you'll be getting these questions. A little bit later on in a worksheet as well. Um, so some of the questions I am going to be answering at the end. So I, I do see people are in the chat as well. Um, so next slide here. So 
this is kind of, I don't want to say the best of the best, but through my work with clients who have overcome binge eating and overeating, this is what I find works the best. And if you take it step by step, it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take a week to overcome binge eating. It doesn't take even a month. But these steps can be really helpful in slowing down those automatic responses to an urge to binge. So the first thing is to just notice without judgment, does something feel off? Do I feel like I'm on autopilot? Um, am I doing something that I just always do? Is it a habit? Um, am I stretching? Am I uh, feeling stress? Am I sensing boredom? You know, some of these things are like, duh, like, yes, yeah, something feels off. So the first thing to do is just notice that. Um, the next thing to take a look at is to reflect and recognize. So literally putting a name to those specific emotions. Um, a few slides back, I had mentioned that it's important to recognize that stress and cookies are not necessarily related. Um, we make them related. So recognizing and naming a specific emotion can help to pull those two things apart in your mind, saying, I am stressed, I am bored, out loud or in your head can be really helpful. And then reflecting on if you've eaten enough in the day. A lot of times I, I work with clients who have simply not eaten enough in the day, and then that primal instinct or the caveman brain pops up and all of a sudden, you know, they're there with a bag of chips and it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Um, the next step would be to actually sit with uncomfortable feelings. Uh, like I said, a healthy brain is going to want to deter you from feeling uncomfortable. That's what a healthy brain does. And so letting yourself be bored or be lonely and knowing that that's okay for a little bit um, can help to dissuade you from really like taking another action, which would be like grabbing some, some food or something like that. Um, another thing to note is that we're allowed to feel uncomfortable and happy at the same time. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, life is terrible and all of that. Um, it's what I like to teach clients. It's called dialectic thinking. So it's DBT. Um, and that really just means like, I'm happy, but also something else is going on. And again, all of these uncomfortable feelings are things that we're not always trained to, to learn to feel, right? We want to not feel sad. We want to not feel lonely. So we're going to do anything in our power to not feel those things. Um, and so my advice is actually to feel them. And so another step, another thing to try is to think of future you. Think of how you'll feel tomorrow. Think of um, experiences that you've had in the past that have led you to not feeling so great if you had binged before um, and thinking of your future self. Uh, engaging in a spiral up activity. Now the words spiral up um, are actually from a book called I think it's called self-love and it's literally in the resources section and we'll get to that in a second but um, the author of this book mentions that you can spiral up or you can spiral down a lot of times we engage in activities that would lead us to spiral down we have one cookie we have 12 cookies we have you know, a pint of ice cream and we're spiraling down if you have one cookie you don't necessarily have to continue spiraling down if you engage in one activity that will help you to spiral up then that is a win and so a lot of times advice would be to journal, go for a walk, read a book, but sometimes it just means to look at the food you're about to binge on and put it on a plate and walk out of the kitchen. That's also a spiral up activity. And the last thing is to celebrate all wins. So any habit change, no matter how small, is a victory. This is, you know, if, if you're really in the throes of, of a binge eating diagnosis, it anything that you can do to deter your brain from those what you might perceive as normal behaviors is a win and it is a victory and this type of work takes a while um, but these are some of the steps that i found can be really helpful so whether they're used alone or in a row 
um, or in order, I should say, these are some really helpful, helpful tips. So let's go down to the resources slide where I will um, remember the book. It is called Body Kindness. That is where Spiral Up comes from. And so some resources, again, these are on the worksheet that I have um, made and will be sending to everyone who signed up. A very helpful book is called Brain Over Binge. This book um, is written by someone who does have a history of bulimia, um, but most of the book is just about brain chemistry and what happens when you have an urge to binge and why it's not always a conscious decision if you've been conditioned to, to do certain things. Um, of course, Body Kindness is, is a great book. The Rules of Normal Eating um, puts a little bit of overeating into, you know, the range of normal behaviors. Sometimes overeating is normal if it doesn't feel like it's a compelled uh, response to stress. Intuitive eating, I love this book. Um, great to help people get in touch with their hunger and fullness cues and kind of see a new light in terms of allowing all foods to fit in your diet. And I do want to mention, you. it's important to, to ask for help. If you really feel that a habit of yours is making you uncomfortable, is causing you health issues, is causing you stress. Ask for help from a dietitian and a therapist if needed. Um, and a healthcare team will help you um, in your recovery. And so I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Um, I do see that we have some in the um, uh, chat box and I'm actually gonna stop my screen share now um, so that I can read it better. Uh, so let's let's go to the questions here. Um, couple questions. So are there any ways to overcome the caveman brain? Ben asks. So in terms of overcoming uh, the caveman brain, um, the first tip I always have is to recognize, right? So the first step is always notice and then recognize. So to overcome a caveman brain activity, a lot of times just noticing what's going on and recognizing what that is can be very helpful. Um, and I just want to make sure that everyone is muted. Sorry. Um, let me just do this. Okay. So uh, that's my best answer for overcoming the caveman brain. Um, it's more something that you recognize and notice, and then typically you won't act on it. Um, and so let's go to the next question here. How long is it normal to sit with uncomfortable feelings? So Carla asks, um, is it no how long is it normal to sit with uncomfortable feelings? So when I'm talking about uncomfortable feelings, these are feelings that come up quite quickly, they might feel very overwhelming. Um, it's kind of like a wave of uncomfortable, uncomfortability, right? Like if that's a word, maybe it's a word. Um, if you have a wave of uncomfortability, ideally you will ride that wave and then move on with your day. If it lasts for days or, you know, even an entire week, then it is time to, to talk to a professional and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, or seeking help from a friend or family member. Um, but the feelings that I'm talking about in, in terms of binge eating are a wave of feeling uncomfortable. Um, I hope that answers that question. Let's read the next one. So um, we have someone saying that their overeating leans more towards cravings than unconscious overeating. Um, okay, so, and this person is saying that they, they're craving salty foods and tend to continue eating until the bag or box is gone. So cravings are, are an interesting beast. Um, sometimes they're actually biological. Uh, it's possible to have a biological craving if you are, if your body needs something. And then we have emotional cravings. So, you know, I saw a commercial on TV for chips and now I want chips and I'm craving them. Um, it's interesting because I feel like this is a two-part solve perhaps. 
So looking at why you might be craving salty foods and then your actions to, you know, why am I eating out of the box? Why am I eating until the entire box is gone? That might be more of an overeating behavior. And then the first step is to figure out why are you craving salty food? So I would look at your intake for the rest of the day and see if you're actually not eating enough food in general, you're not getting enough salt, how's your water intake? Um, I would start there. And if I'm not answering these questions completely, please let me know. You can send me a message and um, we can, um, I can elaborate a little bit more. And so I'm just gonna take a sip of water. So how are cravings different than binging? Should I plan snacks that address the cravings? Are cravings bad? Okay. So again, with cravings, it, it's a, I could do an entire different webinar on cravings um, if we're talking biological cravings. I would first ask yourself, am I hungry? When was the last time I ate? What did I have? And assess your day as a whole. So if we look at step two of kind of the step-by-step -step, uh, slide from before, we are reflecting on our day, we're looking at um, what we've eaten, what we haven't eaten, and that can sometimes help with cravings. If it becomes uh, an everyday thing, then I would not exactly consider that a craving. I would consider that more of, a, um, of an overeating pattern or more of just a habit, um, what your brain is becoming conditioned to. Um, and nothing, I never say that anything is bad. Um, cravings aren't bad, it's just misread signals from the brain, right? So there's something our brain is trying to tell us or something our brain is trying to protect us from. And that is why we have these cravings or why we might overeat or binge. Um, good, I'm glad that, I'm glad my answers were helpful. Um, okay, so, Alexandra, uh, no, that was somebody else. So someone asks, I tend to reward myself with food when I feel like I eat healthy and don't overeat. Um, do you have suggestions for other ways of rewarding yourself but not using food? So my first question would be, or my first step would be to look at your day and see if by you saying that you've eaten healthy if you're actually eating enough. So a lot of times we've had oatmeal for breakfast, a salad with like maybe some protein on it, and then we've had dinner, which is like veggies and protein. And your body needs more than that. So the first thing I would do is look at your entire day and, um, you know, assess, are you having starches? Are you having healthy fats? What is the timing of these things? Um, before, you know, looking at the reward system. But a lot of times we do like to reward ourselves with food for doing something good, which is awesome. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a cookie after, you know, winning a race or something like that. But when it becomes, again, habitual, I would look more into why. Do you feel that you need a reward for eating healthy? And, and why is that? Do you not feel fulfilled with what you're eating in the day? That's what I would take a closer look at. Um, so, oh, my mouse is having a problem. Um, so, as far as particular cravings go, um, typically, if you're craving something that's high in fats, you might not be eating enough fats. If you're craving something high in sugar, you might not be getting enough starch in the day, but it is different for everyone. And that is a question that I have to dive a little bit deeper into. Um, I mean, into your specific intake uh, to be able to give you that, that type of an answer. Um, so sometimes, sometimes it's hard to stop eating, even though I'm not hungry. Um, okay. So when we're talking about eating until you start to feel sick, that would be a sign of potential binge eating behavior. Um, so when I send out the worksheet um, after 
I'll send it out tomorrow with the um, recording. Uh, I would take a look at some of the step-by-step -step ways that you can maybe recognize this type of behavior before it starts, and then also take a deeper look into what's going on in your day-to-day. -day. My mouse has decided to die. Hmm. Oh, it's back. Uh, okay. Let me just let some more people in. Next question. So, so yes, talking about spiraling up. Um, so, so Kate asks, might someone direct a downward spiral up? So yes, of course, right? So. A lot of times I use the metaphor, if you popped a tire on your car, would you then go around and pop all other three tires on the car and have a completely unusable car? If you wouldn't do that for your car, why would you do that for yourself in your day? So let's say using this metaphor, you pop two tires on your car. You could spiral back up and still have a perfectly usable car by fixing those two tires. And even if you pop four tires, you can mend the car by replacing those tires and having a usable car. So looking at it situation by situation, engaging in a spiral of activity might be, again, as small as deciding that you have a craving for chips and not eating them out of the bag, but putting them into a bowl. That is a spiral of activity. Um, so if spiral up activities are hard to do in the moment, um, if you're feeling very anxious while you're at work and you want to use food as a reward, um, what might someone do to soothe themselves in the moment? So sometimes it might be helpful, um, to make a list of things that you can do if you're home or if you're in more of like a dire situation. Um, a lot of times when when you experience the urge to binge, um, it does happen in the same situation over and over again, right? So it might be always at work. It might be always when the kids go to sleep. Um, if you can, before those things happen, look at the situation, the before and the after, and try to make some changes there, like bringing a healthy snack to work, bringing a crossword puzzle or something to help soothe you or like, um, someone had said here, like listening to some music, having those things on hand before the urge comes up can be helpful um, to keep that habit from, from continuing. Um, so someone is also asking about a recommendation, to, a recommendation to not overeat on uh, different types of foods like nuts. Um, and so if you feel that there is a food that you're really tempted to overeat on, I would get a prepackaged um, uh, option, right? So those emerald nuts are a good idea. Um, and putting them in separate areas around uh, your kitchen, instead of them all being in the same spot. Um, setting reminders on your phone, if it does happen around the same time of the day, can be really helpful. Reminding yourself to breathe, reminding yourself to eat mindfully, and to assess from there. Um, so I'm just kind of reading through the chats here. Is there a relationship between binge eating and eating disorders such as bulimia? So I do... I am not uh, an, a researcher on this, but from what I've seen, a lot of people who experience eating disorders, such as bulimia, such as anorexia, become binge eaters as a counteraction to those types of behaviors. And again, from uh, earlier in the presentation tonight, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Our brains and our bodies are trying to protect us. Um, and so whatever that means, if you've been living a very restrictive lifestyle, your brain and your body is going to be like, no, I need food. I need this. I need that. And I need it now. Um, and the most ready, uh, readily available way for your brain and body to get nutrients that it's been lacking are high fat, high sugar, 
you know, high satiety foods, um, which are typically junk foods. I hate to call them junk foods. I usually just call them not everyday foods. And so, yes, the answer to that is there is typically a connection. <laughs> Um, so someone does ask, is it normal to go for a run after a, a, a run? Is it normal to go on a run, a run after binge eating to feel better? Um, so this is a two part question. So I'm going to answer the first one first. Nothing is really like normal or abnormal. If it makes your life better, if you feel like you're, doing the best you can and this works, then like running after overeating like might be okay. But I'd, I would ask yourself, you know, more of why and what's coming from it. Um, I'm sorry, my mouse is being difficult. Um, second part to this question would be um, that a lot of these things are preventative, the things I've been talking about. So once you've already messed up or had a binge, um, how do you stop, right? So how do you stop in the moment? Um, like I said, the logical brain doesn't always have a say once you're in that binge eating moment. What you can do is look at all of the steps and options that um, I, I did list in the um, PowerPoint and see if one of those might speak to you in the moment. Other things you can do are putting up post-it notes in your kitchen or putting things in different locations than they typically are. But a lot of the work does happen beforehand um, or reflecting on a binge eating situation that might've happened and what you could have done differently next time. It's not that there's nothing you can do in the moment, but the best way to overcome binge eating long-term is to do the work before and reflect on things afterwards to see where you can make a change. Yes, you're welcome. Um, so these are really great questions. Um, I do wanna say that I, I do appreciate everyone who's come out here tonight to hear about this topic, maybe not the most fun topic for your Monday night, but it is more common than you might think, right? I've had a hundred, I have, I've had over a hundred people sign up for this webinar. And so if you're feeling that you are alone and that other people aren't experiencing the same thing, I can guarantee you that they are or that they have, or that they know someone who has. And again, all of the tips that I have provided aren't always going to work for everyone. It's a good starting off point um, but to work with a professional, either a dietitian, a therapist, or both, is going to give you exactly what you need from all angles. So before I close out tonight, um, does anyone have any other questions? Completely silent. Um, okay. So with that, I will say everyone have a great night. Um, if you would like more information about OnPoint or would like to email me, you will be getting a email in your inbox. Um, it says, thank you for joining us. It's from info at OnPoint. And if it goes to your spam, make sure you catch it because it does have that worksheet in there. So good night, everybody. Thank you so much. And if I didn't completely answer your questions, please, please reach out and talk to you guys soon. Good night.